Nanya. I like your glasses, Maria, by the way. I know we're live, but, I, but I do like, I'm not seeing you wear those yet. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, when you need to focus, it's sometimes it's for me blurry. Now I need to be really focused. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using those. I'm using those. Друзі, вітаю. Ми з вами у прямому ефірі. Тому дозвольте мені Dear friends, I'm pleased to welcome you. We're already on air, so I would like to start our today's lecture. We're going to have it in English as all of our projects lectures in our international experts expertise sharing. But before we switch to the lecture itself and before we switch to the presentation itself and to our guest today, I would like to start with a couple of organizational moments. Just wanted to make sure that you can hear us and see us well and wanted traditionally to mention how can you use the simultaneous interpretation if you will need it and in what way we're going to be working today. So we are having our lecture today in Zoom, but in the same time, it's being broadcasted on Facebook. On Facebook, it's going to be broadcasted in English and in Zoom, you will be able to choose the simultaneous interpretation if you will need that. At the lower tab, you can see the interpretation button. Uh, see the interpretation button. If you would like to choose, please make sure that you will choose the corresponding language that you would like to listen, English or Ukrainian. If you would like to listen to the interpretation, make sure that you will choose the channel. So once again, the Zoom gives you the opportunity to choose the simultaneous interpretation. If you will press the interpretation globe-like icon on Facebook, we'll only be broadcasting in English. My colleague Anna is going to send you the link to Zoom if you will need interpretation on Facebook. And all of our colleagues who need interpretation will be able to join us in Zoom. So our main our main channel of collaboration today is going to be the chat and the comment section on Facebook. So you can write all of the questions, comments in the chat. I'm going to voice out all of the questions and our today's guests are going to definitely answer those questions. And they will do that as much as our time will allow. So just that was all of the brief introduction, the technical moments. I see that there are some of our colleagues have just joined us. Uh, if you are joining us on Zoom, we will have the simultaneous interpretation option then. And I would like to ask Anna uh, to just let us know on ch in the chat as well how to find the interpretation option on Zoom. And I know that my colleagues are already working and you can choose the interpretation. So right now I will switch to English. So if you would like to listen us in Ukrainian, please choose the Ukrainian channel just to introduce our project and speakers again. So uh, we have already probably the 12th, I guess, the 12th open lecture within the project International Experts Sharing. I'm reminding that the project was launched uh, together with the war. When the war started, a lot of our partners who were abroad and who are abroad, they expressed their desire and they offered us their, their knowledge, their thoughts, their views on the current situation. We were sharing how to deal with the stress, anxiety, how to build resilience, how to, to work in the, to live in the crisis situation, how to work in the crisis situation. Then we moved to business continuity, to the development of new products, new businesses. And what we see now that the, the person like the either it's a manager or the or the CEO or whoever it is, he or she needs to work within the limited resources, personal resource, physical resource, any other resource. So here, all of us who live in Ukraine and work in Ukraine, we're limited in many things. And this limitation on the one hand is a boundary for us. On the other hand, it's a push to start thinking in the other way, to start managing in the other way, to start acting in the other way, to start behaving in the other way, to start doing something differently, and probably to look deeper in the nature of the human side. What pushes us? What drives our reactions? What makes our behave in this or that way? So we need to understand us better. We need to understand our partners better. We need to understand our colleagues better to invent some non-standard, some creative decisions, which, which, which allow us using less resources, but more creativity. And in order to do this, 
we need to go deeper into the nature of the science. So that is why today we have invited probably the best experts in the behavioral science who will share their experience, their knowledge on how to make the best projects happen, how to make the best decision bring revenue, bring success, how to make our customers satisfied. And they will probably explain why on the one hand, the projects which look very successful do not bring the desirable revenue. Why the clients who it looks like we pay a lot of attention to are still not satisfied. So at this, at this open lecture, we will re reveal the subconscious forces that drive our decisions making, how our brain actually works and bring the theory to life with practical examples. We have the experts from all over the world, I would probably say. We have here Jazz Groom. He is a CEO of Kobe Consulting. Uh, this London-based company. We have Rachel Altman. She is the CEO on Behive Consulting, which is based in Budapest. And we have Maria Ferenczuk. She is Behavioral Architect Manager of Kowi Consulting. So she is working for London office, but she is Ukrainian. So that is why you will have this international versatile experience and view on the question. So Jess, Rachel, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mariana, for that amazing introduction. And um, it's a real privilege, guys. So thanks very much for this opportunity. And um, we often do this session um, and people say it's really fun. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. It's really insightful. Um, it's educational. So hopefully you'll learn things. And for one person, it's going to be life changing. We don't know who that is. It might be Alexi, it might be Gav, it might be Alina. We just don't know. But one of you, I think, is going to at two o'clock um, and uh, it's essentially is going to have that, that life changing sort of moment. So um, as Mariana said, there's, there's three of us. So you'll hear some different voices. Um, so um, mine's more kind of Britain based. Yeah. Rachel's more, more Budapest. Um, and then uh, Maria, obviously Ukraine. So we'll switch language a, a little bit. Um, but yeah, if we can start the experience now, Maria, that would be great. Okay. And um, so uh, as Mariana said, we're just trying to bring to life how psychology and behavioral science is being used within businesses, um, within colleagues and, and customers. So um, in terms of three people, we'll do a little bit of background about us, we know it's important psychologically. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm the founder CEO of Cowrie. I'm also um, on the faculty in the Department of Psychology at City University, an honorary research fellow there. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I'll let Maria introduce herself. So yeah, I'm Maria, I'm Ukrainian. You may, we may see this from my last name. I'm happy to be Behavioral Architect Manager at Cobble Consulting. And quite recently, I visited my second education, uh, this time in Behavioral Science from London School of Economics. I got a scholarship for that, so I was selected, so I was really passionate on um, Behavioral Science. But you may also know me from Ukraine, because I was um, a co-founder and director of strategy for Platforma, which is a consulting and media company. So I'm thrilled to be here and to be represent also representing Ukraine at some point. And I will be um, doing parts of this um, session in Ukrainian to make it closer to you. So that's great show. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm really glad to be here alongside Crowry. I am Rachel Altman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Beehive Consulting, which is a Budapest-based behavioral science consultancy, and it's the first behavioral science consultancy in Central Europe. And similarly to Maria, I've also done my master's in London at the London School of Economics in behavioral science. Cool. So that's a little bit about us. And um, so myself and Rachel have been working together for about two years now. Um, there's actually... Um, 20 consultancies um, like ours, so um, 18 more, all around the world. And um, we've all come together to, I suppose, form an alliance, if you like, um, such that we can deliver uh, behavioral science all around the world. And um, so much of behavior is context dependent. So culturally, it really, really does matter. So I think um, I'm the only person in Budapest, I think, that likes uh, milk in my tea, for example. That seems to be a theme <laughs> of my visit. And, uh, but there's lots and lots of cultural differences which make big differences in behaviour and without that local expertise, uh, behaviour can sometimes uh, not occur in the way that we would want. So, so we've got like 151 of us, yeah. I think, in, in all of our uh, companies around the world and very, very well placed and we love it. We just love observing behaviour and seeing what gets in the way of good behaviours um, and then really, really thrilled when people adopt um, some of those better and good behaviours. 
So in terms of the session today, um, so we've got three sections, a little bit about uh, the consultancies, literally it's five minutes, just so you feel reassured that, um, you know, we've got the caliber to be able to interact with people like yourselves. Um, and then we're gonna hand over to Maria that's going to do psychological quiz. So we're gonna mess you up a little bit in your heads, um, uh, maybe for 10 minutes, but we promise that Rachel is gonna put you back together and, um, and explain why maybe you've gone through that. Um, and then also uh, share some case studies so um, and, and about how, how it actually works. Um, and then, yeah, if we've got some time for questions at the end, that would be great. So a little bit about Cowrie, tiny two minute piece. Um, we've got about 50 people um, in London by the end of this year. Um, a lot of people from around the world. Um, so about 25 Brits, 25 people around the world. And Maria has just joined. Uh, we're part of a bigger group um, uh, now. And similar to Rachel, we're professionally accredited. So we're, we've got um, an association with uh, an industry body, which is the Global Association of Applied Behavioral Science. So that's a little bit about London. Regarding the Budapest team, so um, this is our core team. Uh, we are just like Ari, a very multidisciplinary and international team of behavioral science experts, ranging in backgrounds from neuroscience, psychology, finance, economics, and data. All of us specialized in behavioral science, and we have um, gained our expertise in top institutions in the world to be able to bring the state-of-the-art knowledge back to the region. And we have backgrounds from consultants, designers, researchers, and also we have partners in um, business and academia as well. Cool. So in terms of clients, um, big businesses use behavioral science now. I think 10 years ago, no one really had started to apply it. And um, but we work with sort of Amazon and Walmart internationally. And um, so they're like Fortune One and Two. Um, and then some big banks, you know, like HSBC and then some interesting brands like Coca-Cola. Um, so it's a little bit about the clients that are using it in the UK, but also globally. Um, regarding um, our clients, it's mainly in Central Europe, so we're um, in both the public and private sector, but we're mainly focusing on the private sector, and here you can see a lot of uh, market leaders in their respective industries. We worked with like Telecom, MBH, and Mall, and we're also um, active in the public sector, so we've done quite a lot of initiatives with the WHO across Europe as well. Cool. So that's over. So hopefully you're feeling reassured and not sold to, so we're not here to sell anything, we just love the work. So what we're going to do is start to introduce behavioral science. So you might have heard of behavioral economics or nudge theory, or maybe you studied psychology, cognitive or social. Maybe you're an anthropologist or, or maybe you're an evolutionary psychologist. Uh, and, and what we're doing is going to, I suppose, take you on a little bit of a tour um, around some of the academic work in kind of a fun, a fun way and try to explain why we do the things we do. So, so some of you uh, may have read some of these books. It'd be good if you put it in the chat. And um, so if you've read any of these books, just pop them into the chat, just type out the name. Um, we'll see how good you are at typing. And um, But you can see here on the left-hand side, um, these are kind of like the early books of behavioral science. So they was kind of often referred to as like pop economics and pop sociology. And uh, But we really like them because they're really, really easy to read. And then in 2008, there was this formative book called Nudge, which essentially established this discipline of behavioral economics um, and predominantly used within government to nudge citizens. Um, but myself and Rachel and Maria use it within companies um, and the companies that you've seen to help kind of improve like the processes and systems and the products to make sure they go with the grain of human behavior. And then on the right hand side, Predictive Rational came out in 2011. It's a really, really nice read. And then some of you might have uh, picked up Thinking Fast and Slow. So it's a New York bestseller, but it's one of the books that is really quite hard to read. So it's often referred to as the New York bestseller that no one's ever read. So they think that only about 7%, like 6.8% of people actually finish the book. And um, but it's a, be a beautiful book and um, it's just a book that keeps on giving. Um, but if you treat it as a university textbook rather than that nighttime read would be a better way to frame it. And um, if you've not read these books, don't worry. If you have, then join the journey. And um, we're going to take you on kind of like some of the stories, um, which are all experiments. Um, the first one isn't evidence based, but from then on in all of the psychology that Maria and Rachel will talk about is all evidence based. So the first thing is that. Often within organizations, especially big organizations, um, big problems usually have to be solved by the leaders with lots of resources and costing lots of money. Um, and that's not always true, that actually sometimes there may well be some uh, societal or business sort of uh, behavioral change problems that can be solved relatively simply with relatively small interventions that sometimes can ladder up to big impact. So sometimes you might get one that sort of small thing that does quite a lot 
um, in terms of the big event. Uh, but sometimes you might do a number of small things and they combine quite beautifully to create the behavioral change. So I'm just going to take you on one of the stories. Um, and this essentially is the most famous nudge of all. So this is like a small change in the environment. And this particular environment is Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. So some of you might have heard this story and, um, and I'll, I'll maybe hopefully add to that if you have. And, and if you haven't, this is all new. So ladies, uh, this is a male urinal. And it's, this is a really special male urinal um, because it's the most efficient male urinal in the world. Like this is the standout. And when you look at it, you go, well, what's the problem? Well, well, men in airports um, often are kind of like one or two things. They're really bored. So they're not paying much attention to maybe where they're aiming. Or maybe they're a little bit drunk sometimes, but quite a lot of men are drunk and bored in airports, especially after 12 o'clock. So when they aim for the toilet, their aim isn't so great. So they wee on the floor, which is disgusting, I know. But they have to pay for people to clean that up and pay for cleaning fluids. So what they did is they got psychologists involved. It was actually an ex-army um, sort of a, a veteran that studied psychology and took this from the field um, of, of battle, I guess, and brought it into to the, to the, this environment. And you can see here um, that on the right-hand side, the... Um, when the image comes up, you can see that there's a little dot just outside of the holes and it's a little fly. And these men walk in and essentially they aim for that fly because they see it and they go, I'm going to hit that fly. And then they then get a little bit of dopamine. So I'm sure you've heard of dopamine. It's, it's not euphoric. You don't get men jumping up and down and arms raised in the air, but they hit it and get a, a pleasant feeling that they've achieved. And then they then start to think, can I be competitive and aim at that fly for the continuation of my we? Um, and um, and they do that and they get an opioid feedback loop. I'm sure you've heard of opioids, which is slightly stronger, to essentially uh, reward the brain, reward the body, um, and, and ultimately reward the people cleaning and the airport. So I think the statistics bear out that there's an 82% decrease in spillage um, and there's an 8% decrease in overall cleaning costs for the, um, for the airport. And it's saving hundreds of thousands of euros. So I think, yeah, these these types of, uh, of stories, I mean, just be aware there's no academic study on this. And um, so it's not in an academic journal, but it's the most celebrated nudge of all that actually um, small changes in our environment can predictably, systematically, and in this case, fairly sustainably change our behavior for the better. Certainly the men in airports, which is, is a good thing. So that's a little bit of a story, a little bit of fun story, hopefully. And um, but let's get on to it, I suppose, to see how your thinking works, because I know some of you are thinking that that wouldn't work on you um, and um, and small changes don't sort of have big effects. So Maria is going to now do a quiz in Ukrainian. And um, so she's going to switch to Ukrainian and, and we're going to listen to it in English, I think, our side. Um, she's going to go quite quickly and, uh, and she'll explain and um, and just answer the first thing that comes into your head. But I'll, I'll let Maria do all of that introduction. OK. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry for that. I just to switch the, uh, the language, I need to stop sharing because there is no in the menu. OK, yeah, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. So we switched to Ukrainian language, that's good, because we have to do this relatively quickly um, and because um, it won't work. Okay, so we can see it now, Maria, so off you go. So yes, I hope that you're ready. I hope that you're ready because what is it that we're offering you to do in order for us, for you to understand how those nudges work with you and just for you to be able to feel how it works with you, how your thinking works especially when we have certain time limitations. So we would like to ask you to participate in our quiz. We would like to ask you to take a piece of paper or you can use your notes to do that, but please write down your answers to the series of these questions. We will have eight questions. You will have five seconds to answer each of these questions. So you will not have a lot of time. So you will have to write the answer that you believe is the best, the one that you think about. So try not to overthink about the answers to those questions. We're going to start. It will be really, really fast. Try to be really, really fast. The first question is, so the bead and the ball, they, they cost $1.10. The, the bead cost uh, 10 cents more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So take a second just to think about that. Please write down your answer. So three, two, one. The next question. So which of those squares is lighter, the A or the B 
of the lighter shade. Take a look at this picture and just let us know what do you believe to be true. So I hope you had this opportunity to write that down. So again, one, two, three, four. We get into the next question. Okay, please take a look at this sentence and how many how many Fs do you see in this sentence? Please read the sentence and tell us how many Fs do you see in that? So I hope that you have uh, the opportunity to count it. So three, two, one, go. The next question. The five converter, conveyors need five minutes to, to set up five details. How many time is it needed for a hundred conveyors to create a hundred details? Let us know about the answer. So I hope that you have written it down already. So three, two, one, I'm switching to the next question. The question number five, the part of the lake is covered with lilies. So every day the lilies grow as twice at the lake. So in order for them to cover the whole pond, they need 48 days. So how many days do the lilies need, the lilies to cover half of the lake? Think about it. Let us know that. Please note your answer. So just a second to think. So three, two, one. The next question. How many animals have the known or have the Moses have taken to the ark? It has to be really, really fast. I hope that you have noted down the answer. So three, two, one. The next question is. Take a look at this picture again, the picture on the right. So which of those tables is longer, the left one or the right one? That's a very simple question. I hope that you have the answer for the question. So three, two, one, the final question. I'm going to show you the video right now, and you will need to count how many ball passes the team wearing white will do. Just try to count how many times they have passed the ball to one another. So let, that's the video, it doesn't have the sound, so you can just concentrate on counting how many times they passes the ball. So I'm not going to be, I'm going to be silent for that as well. That's good, sometimes the... Okay, so I hope that you have written down your answers and before you will check your list once again, please uh, make sure that you will take a look at that because I'm going to show you the answers. I'm not going to say like what kind of answers those are, but I'm just going to show you how those answers might look like. So you might have had this kind of answers, like 10 cents for the first questions. And you can also take a look at like, just take a look at this list. Just make sure that what you have answered, those not the right answers specifically, but you can just take a look at how it worked out well. Just for you, let us know how many answers like that you have answered as well. You can let us know in the chat if your answers there also are are just the same that those answers you can see on the screen just for us to understand uh, just for us to have a little bit of more interaction with you you can let us know in the chat we're really happy that you joined us so we can want to feel this connection as well so just take a look at your answers take a look at this list take a look at how many points you've got for example that might be seven or there might be eight or them that some people that might have uh, zero points is it good is it bad so we're going to tell you now so okay all of these answers that you have seen that are the most systematic and the most, uh, the most, the, the most that, that we expect the most. So why people are, have those answers and make those answers? Because we have a lot of biases, because we have a lot of biases and we're playing with that. So we're going to take a look at each of those questions and we will see what kind of effect was there. So why your thinking actually guided you to this specific answer. So let us look at all of those questions. The first question. So what is working here is called the frame dependence. 
as far as I have asked you, and I have told you that we can see that the bait costs ten a dollar more than the ball. So we framed the question in the way it means like it's a one dollar more. So it means that you're thinking just wants to take one dollar out of it, and you will have the answer ten cents. But if you will calculate that, you will see that the ball costs five cents because one. 0.5 that plus five cents is going to make in summary one dollar ten cents if the question has been framed in a different way and if i wouldn't have asked you that the bait costs a dollar more then maybe the answer would have been a different one but because of this framing a lot of people would start answering and saying that is just 10 cents the next question that what it what is work here is the relativity bias so it is something that is depend context dependent so those squares the both are of the same color if you do not trust us then we can show you in just in a different way then you can see that in the context and you can see that both the a and the b they're going to be of the same color moreover we can show you this in this kind of interpretation if we'll take the context of then you will see that the both the a and the b squares are of the same color so why do we see that that way because all of the kind of comprehension is being made in the context so this is something that you've used to see so you see the shadow from the cylinder and we believe that it might be darker so that is how do we comprehend it but we can take a look of, of the different experiment please take your finger or maybe like take some piece of paper and please cover this middle part of in between those two fields then you can cover it in front of your eyes or you can cover it closer to your screen and you will see that these parts of this figure are of the same color that's the same illusion so the question number three, well, well, you need to just define the number of the F letters. So right now we're working about the word superiority facts. So people are only considering the words that, for example, starting with the letter F, something that is more visible, like finish, files, factor, there are more visible for us because F is in the beginning of the word. But if you will take a look at the sending closer, then you will see that there is a lot of other words that use the letter F. Why does that happen? If you will take a look at the sentence, sentence in the corner, that, that is because the human brain does not comprehend the, every letter separately, but reads the words all together. So we comprehend all together, but it's easier for us to concentrate on something that we have in the beginning, something that is that were seen by the eye. So if you have counted down six letters, congratulations, you were the right. Question number four, the cognitive overload works here, but also finding out the pattern. What do we mean about that? So when the question is set, like five conveyors need five minutes to create five details, and then I'm asking you how much time do you need if you have 100 conveyors to convey to create 100 details, you want to answer straight away 100 minutes. But no, they will just take this very same five minutes. So you have this overwhelming of the figures, overwhelming of the dates, overwhelming of, of, of the data. So the first thing that you would like to answer is 100 minutes, even though the right answer is five minutes. The next question is about the priming or whether about the priming or the effect of priming. So what do we mean that in order for the lilies to cover the whole pond they need 48 days and in order to cover half how much time will they need so again automatically we would like to think that the half up to 48 days would be 24 days so that's a widespread answer but if we will think a little bit longer if we will analyze in what way this uh, this conquiry is happening that it doesn't mean if, if they cover every day twice as much territory as they had before. If, for example, on the day 37, they have two, they have just half of the pond, then on day 48, they will have all of the pond covered. But if you have this priming, if we had had this priming effect that, you know, half of the lake, we just want to divide 48 by two, which is not the right answer. This is a very interesting question. I love it very much that this is the question that works with the availability bias. So if I'm going to ask how many animals did Moses take into the ark, you want to answer two because we know from the early age that yes, there was like every every animal has taken a pair, but that was Noah who did that, not the Moses. 
and just because that there's some kind of an ingrained memory in a very long period of the of our memory would you know think about the moses was starting to answer the question even though that was just the other person the next question about the tables so what we're talking about here it's about the size constant expansion so we do believe and we comprehend all of this context in different way so we don't we don't depending on how the size is shown we feel the sizes in a different way the tables are the same but because they are placed in different perspective with we see this lens in a different way as well we can show it in a different way if we will turn that table that you have seen on the left the one that looks like a longer and that is the most widespread answer then you will see that the lens is just the same but because we are looking at it from a different perspective and there is a different feeling for width and depth for us it seems for us that the table on the left the one that is placed vertically is longer so i hope that you were able to take a look at your answers of those questions and the final question the final question was here so in this moment we're talking about the inintentional blindness if you have said 13 passes that was the right answer to do you're absolutely right but the question is the next one have you seen the bear the black bear the person the person wearing their bear costume that passes that passes in the video doing the moonwalk in the middle of the video if you have noticed this person that's great it means that you have been even more attentive to the video but let us take a look at the video once again just for you to be sure that i'm not making this up there was the person who was wearing the suit of a bear there So yeah, that was the person there. So if you notice that as well, then well done. And uh, if you haven't noticed this person, that's not that bad. But you know, those are not those those mistakes. There's a lot of things. <clears throat> There's a lot of peculiarities of thinking are connected to that. So it's not a big mistake. There's a lot of people who do in that. Even the students at Harvard, they are doing the same. So that's nothing really, really bad. So please don't be sad about that. Thank you, Maria, for that quiz. So we were looking at some of your answers in the chat and a couple of you got seven or eight, but we saw a lot of you getting two to four answers correct. So this was expected and don't feel bad as Maria said about not getting these right. And this can be explained uh, by the two system of thinking. So if you just look on the next slide, um, we have the two system thinking, which is also called the dual process theory. We can refer to this as system one thinking versus system two thinking. And the idea is that system one is a very, uh, very quick thinking, automatic and effortless. And while a system two thinking is a more slow, deliberate and conscious and effortful thinking. So we can look at this as two characters living in our brain. One of them is Homer Simpson. So you're probably familiar with him. And he's a very lazy, you would say less intelligent, very um, automatic decision maker who doesn't process his thoughts a lot. And this would be a system one thinker. If we look at Spock, the other character living in our brain, this would be someone who is extremely logical. You would say almost too logical, very rational and very calm. And these two characters can represent the system one and system two thinking living in our brain. So if you look at the summary here, system, should we just go on the next slide? System one, as I said, is a very automatic, almost habitual behavior. So something that you might have done many times in the past. It's at a subconscious level. It's also a very emotional um, decision-making process and it's very effortless. So you don't take much cognitive effort or cognitive load to uh, make such decisions. If you go to the system two decision, this is very reflective, more complex, and you could also say more important or less, uh, less frequent decisions. You also have to be more self-aware of such decisions. You need to use more deductive skills and it definitely takes a lot more effort. So actually, um, it's hypothesized that humans make 35,000 decisions a day, among which 90% of our decisions are made in system one. So if you just look at the next example, um, this very simple equation, five times two, is something that we would uh, be a clearly system one thinking. You have to have no effort, no cognitive load. It's something that comes to you very automatically or very habitually. But if you look at something a bit more complex, like 17 times uh, 24, this is the time when you start reflecting and you start creating a much slower and effortful decision-making process. 
And here we just wanted to show you um, what behavioral science really is in a simplistic term. So there are thousands and thousands of decisions we make each day. And this is what Carrie and Beehive deals with as well on how can we better understand these decisions? How can we better understand in the context in which these decisions are made and help people follow through with um, more rational or more optimal decisions because we are subject to a lot of biases and a lot of shortcuts when we make such decisions because we don't have the time to evaluate all of these individual decisions that might not be so important, such as going to the grocery store. So this is what behavioral science is really about in a simplistic term. And now we're gonna go into some global case studies that Jazz will, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Yeah, so, so hopefully you found that fun, insightful, educational, and uh, maybe for one of you, sort of life-changing. So um, we deliberately do go quite fast. And um, so we're just gonna slow down the pace a little, a little bit. And, and as, you, as you heard from Maria and Rachel, the reason why we do do that fast is we're trying to get that kind of automatic response from your brain. Um, because when you're assessing, as Rachel said, a lot of the decisions you make in daily life, um, you often make these decisions subconsciously and quite quickly and, and, and often not introspectively. You don't actually know that you're making a, a decision or not. So we've got three case studies. One is from um, a UK construction site. So I guess in your business, this is kind of like the guys and girls that are digging up roads, like a really manual kind of job and how, how we might change behavior, like in health and safety. Um, often health and safety protocols are checklists and authority based. So someone seeing you tells you to do something and there's a penalty if you don't do that um, or a checklist. We love checklists. We think they're really, really good, but sometimes checklists um, aren't designed in, in, in the right way. So we're going to show you a case study, which Marie is going to again explain in, in Ukrainian of some work that we did um, in the UK um, for Shell, so um, for the head office, for, for their fit out. And then after that, um, Maria will talk through um, a coronavirus case study that she worked on uh, when she was um, in Ukraine. And then we'll come back to some work in Germany uh, with a financial services provider. Um, and it's very kind of, com behaviors kind of can seemingly be like common sense, but actually um, it's incredibly complex and, and does require professionals. So I'll let Maria talk about this um, amazing sort of case study about how we got so it's grown men to be more safety conscious in the world of work. Yes, thank you, Jazz, for this introduction. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce this case because I haven't been working on this, uh, developing this case, but I really wanted to work on this project and I hope that we will do many projects together. Then again, why I wanted to do that in Ukrainian, because there was a lot of context factors that I really wanted to explain knowing behavioral studies. Um, and also what I wanted to say, but so there is that the, the, the difference on uh, the, and we're going to, we're going to also cover the differences about the behavioristics and behavioral studies there. And we'll go into, we're going to be going to be working on that later on. So. We're going to be speaking about the cases that the were that the chair says, and you're going to see the video and you can listen to what I'm going to say. I'm going to guide you through this case. So the first case is about the example that Jess has mentioned. Uh, so uh, the nudging is actually something that can be used for actually guiding people for a more sustainable behavior. So one of the construction projects that has been working about on the 29 story building in London, they also use this nudging technique to make the construction site more safe. So they've had around 250 workers every day on the construction for the, for the counterparts and for the company problem, people working there and the safety was the main priority for the company. But it was very important to make sure that uh, the behavior, that, that the safety would be the main priority for the workers as well, because it would be important to make sure that the people would also, people there on the location would feel uh, that they need to take care about, take care for the safety, not only when they're reminded by certain safety signs. In order to reach this result, they've all called the company, have gone to the recovery consulting, they have analyzed the contacts, they have seen the behaviors of the workers, and they have offered some interventions that have been based on the behavioral science and the psychological principles. One of them was the intervention that you can see on the screen. Thus, it seems like it's a contrary intuitive uh, 
that using uh, the pink color to make your behavior safer, how they've used that after they have researched the contacts and the research, the behavior of the construction workers, and after the scientific research, that company has seen a couple of interesting insights. First of all, there was a big appetite to risks around the, the around the workers. That was because of their high level of testosterone. There was a lot of timing pressure, and that means that they have taken the risks more frequently. The older construction workers that have never had a traumatic experience, they were really optimistic. Even though that there is a dangerous site, they know that nothing bad is going to happen to them. And so it actually why it's, it, that brought as this neglection of safety to as a social norm. And um, so that is why in order to decrease the testosterone levels, then the territories, uh, they have been colored in the Baker melon pink, the specific color, the pink uh, color that is used for actually calming down the violent, violent, violent prisoners also. So it helped actually to calm the workers down when they got to their shifts. Also, they put additional plants, additional furniture, giving a lot of natural lights in the canteen. So that is a small change, but it was a very important change as well. So in order to reward the safe behavior, they've also have created the so-called the golden car schemes. So every worker, they've had this card and they needed to sign this card. And thus, they have also increased the personalization and the ownership of this card. Moreover, each of those cards have had these time of the membership when the membership has started just to emphasize how long they have been at this position and what is their own impact the availability of this card are given them the opportunity to participate in the company the lottery to have the prizes and uh, by the end of every week you might have won the prize once for example the prize were was a, a TV, a 55 inches TV that was uh, that was just not just one single present. There was a lot of different presents. But if, for example, someone has seen doing some kind of dangerous behavior and the card has been taken away, and if the group, the team has been, has been taken off with a three card, then they have been finalized as well. So there was this additional moments uh, we just need to track the time. There were some additional changes that were applied as well, but they have given a lot of good and interesting positive changes. So we've had the decrease of the dangerous behaviors by 82% at the, at the highest uh, floors, but the dangers of behaviors of for using the materials has decreased by 93%. So th those were the small changes that have caused the very big and interesting results of shocking results that the big companies might not have had before. So just for you to understand what small changes, what kind of a big impact and big results that the small changes might have and might cause. So that was a very big and impactful case. The next case, uh, there was the case that is slightly different. That is contrasting example from those big, um, th those big examples that has been implemented by the Covery Consulting. So that was a very small example, something that you have definitely felt. And this is an Ukrainian Ukrainian example, something that we have done was one of the practices. So why I wanted to make this contrast because I really wanted you to understand that you might use it not only for a big scale project or something big businesses, but you might also use it as for the small interventions in your company starting from tomorrow. For example, we all remember there was the time of COVID and we had this pandemic moment. And you remember that we needed to learn that we will have to wash our hands, you know, to say hi, you using our elbow. So all of those different interesting new habits, in what way we're building those habits? Well, first of all, you can um, hold some posters or we, you know that there is still working there. And But what is important that the, there's a, a couple of moments. First of all, it's a very far away, the posters that are hanging over there, you're doing something else, and these posters are not personalized. It's not doesn't belong to you, you do not own it. So we decided that we're going to be, what can we do? We started with that inside. What is very close to the people? What do they carry every day? What do they have in their hands? And they have the smartphones. And averagely, the people that unlock your smartphone 40 times a day, you touch it, you unlock it, and you can use that as well. 
So that is why we wanted to make this additional flash videos with, uh, with gives you the opportunity to remind yourself about what kind of good habits you might have for the smartphone. And we made it available. So we've had it. First of all, we've had this visual trigger. We have this soap. You can see the soap and your screensaver. And we've also had posted some additional phrases on it. For example, keep distance, use your elbows if you sneeze, wash your hands. Like you don't touch your face, uh, disinfect your hands, uh, for the people to be reminded about those new behaviors that they need to do. That was very interesting that those screen savers and those screens covers have been downloaded multiple times for a couple of thousand times, and we can see how the people have used this. So we've actually had an idea of actually getting that, making this change as closer to the person as possible to make it personalized. But this is the case is just a small illustration that you might use straight away tomorrow. But the next case, Rachel will tell you about the case. It's a full scale and very in-depth case. So please make sure that you will listen to it carefully because it's going to give you the insights on the mechanics, how we can do that. So Rachel, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. So yes, this is the last case study we wanted to bring to you today. And because you've seen some amazing outcomes of behavioral science case studies, for this last case study, we wanted to give you a little bit of insights on how a project is built up and a little bit of how it really goes through. So this is a very complex process to get to these outcomes. So this is a finance and a beyond banking case study specifically in Europe, in Germany. Uh, the client was Volksbank Digital. And the main challenge was that they have a so-called generational consulting um, service, which is an end of life wealth and health management um, service. And they wanted to digitalize this process. So traditionally, this was an in-person process. We could just jump to the next slide to show you. Um, this was an in-person physical process where consultants had to gather all the information from the clients. And Volksbank asked us to digitalize this process, but ensuring that we help with creating an emotionally supportive um, platform and journey for the customers, because this is a very psychologically challenging and draining process. So the approach here was first the insights generation, so really about understanding the behavior. And this was phase one. And once we understood the behaviors we wanted, we were looking for, the second phase was how can we change this behavior? So in the understand phase, we started with a barrier um, analysis. So we wanted to understand what are the key barriers and frictions that are inhibiting the uptake of this service. And here we identified through a literature review some key factors such as trust, digital affinity, motivation, perceived value, and some other factors. And once we identified the most important factors for uptake of this service, then we created a behavioral analysis, or we call it a behavioral audit, to see how these um, different factors contribute to the existing platform. So for instance, if we look at trust, we looked at the entire future care platform on how, what are the different frictions that inhibit trust so that people might not trust the service or might not want to upload their documents or share their information. But from the other angle, we also looked at the opportunities of how can we implement different behavioral science techniques to build trust. And we did this with each of the different elements. Furthermore, we also did a primary research to have a much more in-depth understanding of the local context. So we did in deep interviews with consultants and uh, the clients um, in order to better understand the differences between these groups. So you can imagine there was a very big population of elderly, but there were also people with larger wealth management needs. So we really needed to understand the behavior, pain points, and motivations across these different target groups. So if we just jump to the next slide, um, you can see that once we have gathered, gathered all of these insights, we needed to understand what are the key interventions that we would uh, be implementing to achieve the overarching goal. And here you can just see a little bit of a, just a small bit of the interventions on the elements of trust, motivation, and social factors. So what we looked in trust was very important to emphasize the security of the platform and also to create a seamless uh, communication experience to reduce and eliminate any frictions that might come up that might um, lose trust throughout the process. Motivation was a very big one as well. So it was very important here. How can we minimize the perceived effort of um, signing up to this and following through the entire process? But on the other side, it was also important to increase the perceived usefulness and the perceived need for this service and the relevance for those individuals. So these were some of the aspects we looked at motivation. And then for the social factors, for example, we also looked at how can we integrate social norm messages and social norm interventions in order to establish a sense of social acceptance so people feel included and that they feel that this is something that is accepted and actually used across their um, target groups and across their um, locations. 
So what we did then um, in the next slide, you can see a matrix of some of the key interventions. This might look a little complex, but we just wanted to visualize to you how all these interventions actually play a role with the different target segments. So on the left side, you can see some of the summaries of our key targets. Um, for instance, the largest uh, user base was your senior user bases, and the second and third was the family-focused individuals and the very finance-focused. So we needed to ensure that we focus and prioritize these segments and identify the key intervention that will achieve the highest effect among these target groups, but also with relatively um, medium effort size from the client side in terms of development costs. So finally, um, once we have prioritized these interventions and selected the key segments in the last uh, slide, you can see the different outcomes that we have implemented. So if we just jump to the next screen, um, here is just a quick snippet of how we actually audited the entire platform and integrated different behavioral science driven interventions, communication techniques, design, social norm messages, and redesigned the entire platform to achieve the overarching goal of increasing trust among the users, emphasizing the security of the platform, that they can share their information and this information will be confidential and stored well. The second one was reducing the emotional strain throughout the process. So we wanted to provide reassurance throughout the whole journey, show that empathy towards the clients and give this emotional support from the very beginning of the journey all the way to finalizing and signing up to generational consulting. And finally, which is in connection to this, is we ensured process follow through because there was quite a big issue before that a lot of people felt it was such a challenging process that they just stopped throughout the process and didn't finish and go through with it. So we um, use behavioral science to increase their perceived ability and self-efficacy so that they feel that they're capable of doing this, but also to decrease the perceived effort of following through with the service. So this was just a little bit of insight on a more methodological case study. And now I'm going to give it back to Jess to just put this all together. Cool. Um, so thank you very much, that uh, Rachel and Maria. So, so in summary, and um, <clears throat> we talked about three sections. So I just want to sort of highlight sort of three kind of takeaways, um, I guess. And so the first one is that um, businesses are now using behavioral science. So it's been used in governments, uh, predominantly in like America, uh, UK and Australia, but we're seeing it more and more in governments um, around the world. Um, but there's a growing body of work that's being done by consultancies like Beehive and Cowrie um, that um, are really starting to look at the experience that you create either internally in the organization, how you interact with each other, um, or how you interact with your customers or, or citizens. And, um, and it's really making a difference. So the field is about 10 years old, and um, but um, so it's still relatively new um, in terms of innovation, and uh, but it's growing really, really quickly um, and, and lighting fires around the world. The, the second key point is that um, hopefully we're brought to life through the experience of the interactive quiz, um, that your brains often jump to decisions um, and you can't stop that. So now we've told you that, um, don't think that you can now be in control of your agency. Unfortunately, you can't. So um, what you can do is be more aware of it. But when you're time pressured, as you found, or maybe when you're in a, a time of stress or, or anxiety, or maybe when you're really, really excited, um, you might jump to some of these decisions. So um, and that's really, really important. You know, we want people to make good decisions about their finances, for example, maybe when they're, they're not acting with their emotions. You know, you don't want people to make poor decisions when they're sad. Or equally, you don't want people to buy things that cost phenomenal amounts of money just because they're really, really happy because that might not be in their best interest. So our, our brains operate with this dual operating system. And then the final piece is it really, really does work. And um, so all of our work is scientific. So everyone is kind of accredited. So they spent time studying all of this at universities um, it, within Ukraine, within uh, Budapest, within London, all, all around the world to deliver a really, really professional experience so you can take it to stakeholders within your business. I mean, I was very fortunate to work on, on the Pink Wall study with the reward scheme. And, um, you know, that, that, was a, that was a study that a lot of the, the executive uh, committee they were kind of, they thought it wouldn't work. And, um, and when we proved it, there was like an 82% reduction, as Maria said, in working at high unsafe behaviours. The probability of that being due to chance was one in 69. So 68 out of 69 times we'd expect the same sort of order of magnitude of result. And that means business people can make some really, really good, robust and valid decisions. 
So that is us done. Um, timing wise, we rehearsed it really well. And um, I think so we've got five minutes. And um, so yes, if anybody's got any questions, then please pop them in the chat. Um, it might be quicker, maybe Marie, if you answer them in Ukrainian, maybe <laughs> rather than going through the simulcast, but but happy um, if people want to answer and ask questions or not. And, um, and yeah, I really, really hope today was fun, insightful, educational. And for one person, maybe Daria, that was life changing. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I know that we do not have much time, but still we have two questions in the chat. And I also have one question. So let's let's be at least committed to this three. If there are more, we will see how we will answer them. Uh, the first question is connected with the case Maria presented. Maybe if Maria doesn't mind, she would answer this question. The people are asking, whether this approach with the painting the walls into pink, whether it works for other companies where the security is also very important, uh, or we have to make a separate investigation for each case regarding on the, on the I don't know, different criteria, age and whatever else is important for the workers that who are involved in the in the work. I think I think Jess is better place yeah. to answer. Okay. 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 Yeah, that's no, fine. Yeah. Um, so, so the first thing to say is like the, the psychology behind color isn't as robust as some of the other principles we've described. So, so some principles we know that you can design and, and behavior really does follow, but color is a little bit less predictable. And um, and that particular color, um, as, as you heard from Maria, essentially it just reduces levels of testosterone, um, which can be associated with aggressive behavior or, or risk taking. And, and the, the, honest, the honest answer, and it's a really good question, is you don't know until you conduct an experiment, because you're exactly right, it might not translate as well, it might be better, it might be worse, or it might have, have no effect. So one of the things as behavioral scientists is, we, I suppose, replicate a lot of our experiments interventions if the context changes, because so much of behavior is context dependent. And then I'll just caveat one thing is that we think the reward scheme uh, was the most powerful part of that intervention. And then, um, but um, the media and when it was picked up by, as you saw by the BBC, um, they really liked the pink story. We think that was a smaller effect within the overall effect. We think um, I've heard about the security. I do not remember where I read this experiment uh, about the photos of the kids, that the photos yes. of the kids were placed in the office, like I don't know, from father, we're waiting for you. And there were real, real photos of the kids, and that also impacted the level of security. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think the messenger effect. So a lot of our behavior can be driven by who communicates the message. And I think children can be really powerful, um, especially around things like lifestyle, like a, a, a obesity or maybe alcohol, those types of things that, that are close within. So family. the first hint you have to know exactly the people and you have to know their values, what drives them. Only after that you can use agreed. and develop the, the relevant instruments. Mm -hmm. I, I agreed, yeah. I mean, there's been studies done on eyes, I think, to try and get people to, to wash their hands. Um, and I mm -hmm. think male eyes were more, were more powerful than female eyes. We don't know why. And, um, and so, yeah, so it is really dependent. But yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll let the other guys answer the other question. Thank you. Uh, let's move to the second question. The people asking what would be your quick answer, some quick piece of advice uh, uh, on some actions to be done in order for the employees not to be afraid to answer the surveys or the questionnaires in case like if it's not anonymous, how to increase the level of trust? Um, I have some thoughts on this and then maybe you guys can add, but I think one of the things is empathy. So you definitely need to ensure in the communication that it's an open environment, that people feel empathetic and that this is accepted. So I think that's very important and also providing feedback. So maybe some social norms that how other people are doing it and ensuring that, you know, feedback on your behavior. And I think also the element of fear, how you could um, eliminate, eliminate elements of fear from that. But maybe you have some. Yeah, so, Maria, have you got any more thoughts? Yeah, I mean, there is a there is a really influential concept of psychological safety on workplace in organizations overall. And my take on that would be that if you want people to um, to answer this questionnaire, the best idea would be not to start from questionnaire. If they don't feel safe answering your questions, probably the issue is not on questionnaire itself. It's, it's just a sign of it. It just maybe a sign of the fact that people don't feel themselves safe enough 
in this particular environment, for instance. So and the, in a nutshell, you don't need to look at the questionnaire itself. You need to also address the context in which this questionnaire exists. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. It really, really, really not only makes sense, but it's really like a very uh, important thought. Um, the participants are thanking you for the interesting information during this presentation, and they are asking, have taken into account your experience, whether there are any uh, acting tools, how to make the habit of sorting the rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think, um, yeah, ha having the right, the right size of bin for the right size of rubbish is really important. So, you know, um, there's been a lot of studies done that if you want to stop people, I suppose, having a particular type of rubbish, just make it really, really hard for them to fit it through the slot. And then they'll find it really difficult and they'll, they'll stop using that. So that might be you know, plastic. So you make it really difficult, um, but you make it really, really easy to, to maybe recycle some things that you do want them, them to use. So I think, yeah, um, a physical representation of making it easy or hard, depending on what behavior you, you want, is uh, is one that I think is demonstrated to work again, again and again and again. Yeah, and we also did a project on this. So I think what's important here is you need three elements for the behavior to occur. So you need the motivation for them to do it. So also awareness about this and what the impacts are, um, ability to do it. So a lot of times the signs are not clear and people feel confused and uncertain, or they just have a lack of self-efficacy, like where to throw it. And what's the right behavior and the last one is a trigger so if you have a habitual behavior to not recycling or not throwing the, it in the right place you need to initiate a new behavior or changing an existing habit by providing some kind of trigger which should be designed according to the context whether this is at the workplace at an airport etc but it's important to provide a trigger to then initiate this behavior provide feedback on that and then the motivation and the ability will come through that yeah, and to bring that to life. So, so one of the challenges we have is to get to get young men predominantly to stop buying plastic water bottles from stores. Yeah. And um, so, so going building on what Rachel said is, what do you want them to do? You want them to bring a water bottle to work every day or whenever that wherever they are. So we created a, a skill on Alexa. So when you leave Alexa and you, you know you leave your home or Google, you might say Alexa, switch the lights out, and it says. I'm switching the lights out, Jez, but remember to take your water, hot water bottle for work today. And that demonstrated to improve the use of yeah. water bottles by 82%. So these are really, really simple kind of nudges that just make it easier to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Thank you for your involvement and your input. I know that we are limited on, on time. So I, hope, I know that you have other commitments. So I just probably will stop here. And I do appreciate your time, efforts, and involvement into the projects so of Jazz, Rachel, Maria. So thank you for, for being with us, for sharing this information. We will stay in touch. So I thank you, the participants, for having time to join us. And let me make a little advertisement that uh, the next lecture will be also devoted to behavioral science. We will have um, we will have a, a, the author of the book, which was advertised today predictably irrational. So we will have the author in this project as well. So in, in June, he will be given an open lecture. So just please follow the announcement of the Academy Attack and join the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us.